Good afternoon, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. I do bet that the minute I start speaking through history, the arena will be overcrowded in a minute. And well, first of all, let me thank Talone del Mobile, the staff, and in particular, Placca uh, Zanoletti, Patrizia Malfatti, Anna Lisa Rosso. And also, there's, a, there's another person that I love uh, to actually thank, uh, and that, that is indeed uh, the crowd of people behind the scene, behind the celebration, not talking through uh, people working in companies, but also those who worked uh, in Booth uh, with a lot of effort, a lot of sweat over the last few weeks. So, so I know it is a moment for celebrating today, but I'd love it to remind also Gastone Faraoni. He was working here a week ago, and while he was working, he passed away. So, I do have a good news and bad news uh, for all of you. Let's start from the bad news. Uh, well, it will be just me today. It will be only myself. This is how it goes. But the good news is that I am, I am not a cartoonist. Uh, I don't draw, so you will not have to tolerate my sketches or drawings. Uh, so, you will be spared of that. So. Um, I have tried to organize this meeting today in such a way that I can get across this idea. Well, the history of mankind, of men and women from the very beginning, it has been strongly determined and told through the production of furniture, goods, objects, uh, that in a, very, in a very powerful manner we have uh, we're given to this planet. And this is always true, but this is specifically true for 1900. 1900 is the century that actually has crowded houses with a lot of objects. We have literally populated the planet with our inventions, uh, objects and things. And if we further zoom in, this, because, this becomes even more precise for the history of Milan. This is even more relevant. Perhaps uh, this has happened back in September already, but you might have counted posters saying M Milan is design and and that is very much the case so the city of milan cannot be told unless you go through the history of milan and the history of salone del mobile and at the same time i think it is very difficult to tell through the history of design and salone del mobile unless you tell the context say so what's going on meanwhile both in the world and in italy more specific so today the narrative will be around the 60s edition of a of salon del mobile of course uh, it would have been fairly long fairly impossible to tell to tell over them i would have taken 60 years so i will actually go through decades and i will actually take a kind of a general overview a snapshot of the historical political economic uh, overview and snapshot and then I will zoom in in what's going on in here, in the Salone itself. So the very first chapter opens on uh, September 24, 1965, when Alessandro Colli, Angelo De Baggis and Tito Armellini, they organised, they found a committee of the Salone del Mobile in Milan and uh, this salone was then being established with a very precise objective that is uh, to bring Italy become the key exporter of design all around the world and the objective during the first decade is absolutely it in 1961 the very first edition actually includes uh, 328 exhibitors uh, there are over 2000 today and uh, 11 12 12,000 visitors uh, who are not yet visitors. Uh, they are, are indeed operators because uh, the exhibition was not open to everyone. It was only open to trade fair, to professionals. 
and we're actually shifting from that amount up to 45,000 visitors and the booths are actually 1,500, 1,500 exhibitors, not too far away from the 2,000 we have today. But actually, when it comes to export, we're making a major leap from 9 billion export in 1961 to the 65 billion in 1969. And, well, I did say that I would have told you what happened both internationally and uh, with a greater zoom in in the history of Salona, but I will actually go even further beyond. I will go beyond the planet. Uh, actually, the decade it starts with the 1961, the first voyage in a spaceship to an extraterrestrial orbit, Yuri Gagarin. 1969, Louis Armstrong, he lands on the moon. And actually, design is mirroring all this, and indeed, the, the shapes are, are very much a space style. They're looking at the future. And in Milan, if we shrink it further, something else is happening, something very important. 1964, they are inaugurating uh, the uh, great uh, uh, central market, European uh, great central market, that it did not really happen. But for that to be the case, they were actually opening uh, the M1, uh, the Milan Underground, which is perhaps something you also took and traveled on today. There's an interesting anecdote. So Milan Underground was being designed by Bob Norda and then was executed furniture-wide by Albini and Elge. And uh, Bob Norda, of course, uh, he was defining a special lettering uh, for, uh, for the design, uh, which is called Norda, but it is actually shrinking the lettering to the number of letters it really needs uh, to develop to call the tube stations. Fiera Milano City, of course, uh, back in 1964, was not there. Bob Norda, when he was interviewed uh, and uh, when this new stop uh, was finally opened, and actually, if you pay attention and you look at the letters, for instance, the Y, which is a new character that Bob Norda had not considered, well, he answered, uh, well, perhaps uh, everybody thought that I was, I was dead because uh, nobody from the municipality actually spoke to Bob Norda to update the characters uh, and they were actually adopting a more traditional one. 1963, there's another crucial event for the impact it will have on furniture and design and that is uh, Giulio Natta is winning Nobel Prize for Chemistry for the invention of the isotactic melapropylene moplin for friends. So the world is invaded by plastic and perhaps some of you remember the graduate, the movie 1967, Dustin Hoffman is being approached by a billionaire who says to him, young man, I'm saying one word, plastic, and that is a kind of a condemnation that we're still fully immersed. It was kind of a prophecy back in 1960s, 60, the years of great optimism toward this colorful world, a world that when a revolution is actually taking place, as Argan used to say, the revolution between the mass and the weight of objects. So those objects, uh, they're actually people were expecting to be extremely heavy and typically would be Italian style object or as Joe Ponte used to say the fictitious Italian style where these objects they become lightweight and something unbelievable happens pieces of furniture becomes cabinet rear cabinet what well, they always call a cabinet but you could not move them around you would now go you would go into a house which perhaps you had inherited from your parents and grandparents and you would never move furniture anymore. Whereas plastic, it makes this possible. You can actually move objects around your house. You can build and rebuild your own world. These are the nomadic objects. Thing. And actually there's another revolution back in those years, the kitchen appliances. Now, 
We tend to believe that the history and the Italian revolution went through the four wheels, but actually, if you take a look at numbers, in that decade, 58-68, only 10% of people would have a car, where most of people, and I'm talking perhaps about 60% of family, they had a refrigerator and a TV set, which, of course, uh, would greatly impact uh, on consumption as well. So what happens in Salone del Mobile in those years? Uh, well, at, at the very beginning, they had started off uh, with a language, uh, uh, with a very homogeneous language uh, when, uh, when developing boots. Uh, and uh, we just call them boots, but they're indeed exhibitions per se. But let's say that at the beginning, the ex ex exhibition would actually have all the boots all the same. Well, all of a sudden, somebody has the intuition of designing their own boot. And this is indeed something uh, that will impact everything that we can still appreciate nowadays while we walk around the Salone. Chapter number two, we go forward, the 70s. Now, such div division in, a, a, in decades, it does not perhaps really make sense because actually the 70s do not start in the 70s, uh, also design-wise. There's something else that happens uh, in Milan that is really important that actually happened before 1969, and that is a, an explosion in Piazza Fontana. And uh, what's happening back then? Uh, so. Well, uh, of course, uh, that means the tension strategy that uh, all of the Italian population is experiencing, and that is uh, impacting uh, heavily Milan and the rest of Italy. And design and furniture will actually reassure people. And uh, they are developing what we call the middle class syndrome. So the main, uh, the main people who were purchased, uh, who were purchased uh, furniture are also people who were experiencing those very, that very great moment in history. And one of the I can uh, back, back in those moments uh, is uh, the so-called uh, Grey furniture from Totas. Grey, he says, is a sad colour. Grey is the colour of my bid as I old, as I get old. Grey is a colour that actually put difficulty to put in difficulty those who want to advertise toothpaste and liquor and wine. You know, so he's actually trying to um, try to overturn this idea, but indeed, uh, great furniture are reassuring in those years. Uh, and actually, the range is, is quite big, and the supply goes hand in hand with the demand. 1963, something else happens, uh, and actually, no more optimism from the prior decade, the oil crisis. Well, we start understanding that uh, plastic uh, will not last forever, so will not be available forever, and that has an impact uh, on furniture production. We go back to neutral colour, we go back to more reassuring styles. In those years, uh, we come across uh, the primary design research on material, colours and finishings. Uh, and in 1969 is a very strategic year in the history of design as a two episodes are taking place. Uh, two episodes, quite in contradiction one with the other, but they're two natural episodes. Uh, 1969, Joe Ponti is, uh, is passing away, so he's dying, the real father of Milan modernism. And that same year, 1969, the term postmodernism uh, is being in place. So, there's a great new attention being paid to anything that has to do with surface. And the 70s uh, is uh, still the century of great success of Salone del Mobile. Remember, I did say we had had uh, 11,000 visitors becoming 55,000. At the end of the 70s, we have overcome 127,000 visitors. And in this case, they are really visiting. 
and uh, so Salone becomes open to the public. And then we go forward, the third chapter, the 80s. Well, the, uh, in this decade, we're back to optimism. The year of boom, 1982, Italy's victory in the World Cup. So the, uh, the general relief is improved. Uh, and something else happened in 1980, which is not perhaps so uh, crucial on the literary impact on design, which is not there, but it's interesting for a different reason. So Umberto Eco is publishing The Name of the Rose. And uh, actually, the 80s are the years uh, when the interest in semiotic, semiotics uh, is becoming more, more important. And it's more and more uh, dedicated to the world of objects. Uh, Baudrillard is uh, writing uh, the system of objects. Uh, and he's basically saying that the relationship that man has with objects in this decade of 1900 is actually changing everything. We're talking about unessential goods, things that we're not, take, we're not taking advantage of, that are not being used because of the function of use, but for a second or third level, symbolic level. And there's also a communication level, as if the image of things of objects and we're still very much immersed in the 80s and 90s so as if the image of things is even more important with respect to the object themselves and then 1984 when the cover of time is uh, dedicating uh, it's a cover to the man of the year and that is the computer the personal computer 1986, uh, things are becoming more complicated, the explosion in uh, Chernobyl and the slogan of the world, of a poisoned world. And 40 years away, we have understood that the world did not poison itself. Uh, it did not get sick uh, as per a physiological, let's say, process, but we have heavily contributed to it. But of course, all of those topics associated to the environment, well, they start being, uh, let's say, detected and emphasized. Although that is the moment where appearance is the most important thing. And actually, the Salone del Mobile is being told by journalists, researchers uh, and critics as a kind of a touristic experience, as if you were visiting Venice. And the brand of Salone del Mobile in those years has a huge success. Italy is, and actually Milan, is finally winning over Cologne and is becoming the key exporter in the world when it comes to furniture. So it is a huge, unique success. Gillo Dorfles, he uh, wrote an article in uh, September of that year, 1985, and, uh, and actually it's been a sixth edition of Salone del Mobile, and uh, we are all used to actually experience in April, and this year this is an exception, it is in June, but for the first time of its life, a Salone would actually take place in September. So Gilo Dorfles uh, was writing the article in September, saying, what is the health of design? Well, the design is in a great shape whilst it's visiting the Salone. The quality, less so. And uh, something important that I should have said at the very beginning, well, it is actually embedding one very key feature, different from any other exhibition. Say, in 1961, Biennale, Triennale, Expo, were also being organizing, happening every two years, uh, three years or five years, whereas Salon del Mobile was the very first trade fair taking place on a yearly basis. And this, of course, goes hand in hand with pros and cons. It has a flip side of the coin because it actually means that you need to change continuously in a very dynamic manner to the point that uh, La Pietra is uh, wondering about the following. So how, to what extent the products uh, which have been exhibited in those years uh, are actually going to be manufactured and produced? Uh, and uh, that it, it sounds like a naive question, but it, of course it makes uh, very much sense. 
1980s are also the years of uh, Memphis, year of alchemy, the history of design, and the years when uh, such a phenomenon uh, which is becoming uh, very important uh, starting from then the Fuori Salone was being established uh, and uh, the very first exhibition it takes place September 18th 1981 and they start considering that anything that happens uh, in the key Salone that was taking place uh, in an older venue, by the way. Well, the Fuori Salone might actually be more niche, uh, might be more based on craftsmanship rather than on mass production. 1989 is a crucial year for the history of Salone, as the little brother was born. Well, little brother to some extent because it was indeed uh, uh, been crucial for the years to come and that is the Salone Satellite. Salone Satellite is indeed a group together all of the experiences uh, from young designers who are not yet working for large companies but they aim to do so. So during this Salone the Satellite they have a a huge, uh, a huge possibility of, uh, of showing their work, of showcasing their work. Most of the international talents uh, who will become successful in the year 2000, 2010, they actually went through Salone Satellite with Marva Griffin. Salone Satellite will also be rewarded uh, the uh, Golden Compass. 1986, Cosmet is actually being awarded uh, the Golden Compass. As we, as we move forward, uh, we reach out to the 90s. Well, the 90s are very turbulent years, uh, and you can tell this is April 12th. There was this big transition. As you might know, a Salon del Mobile goes hand in hand with climate change. So it, it is always raining, actually, to the point that they didn't want to organize it in April because there was no rain. So how about we wait for June so that it might rain finally? Well, back to 1991, they decided that perhaps September were far too hot. So why don't we move it back to April so that uh, we may actually have rain all the time? So, so 1990s, uh, 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 on that year, it is, uh, Salon is not taking place. And actually, uh, people tell me this is the Tixit edition, but the maths uh, is not quite working. So we're starting from 1991. So what is the political and international scenario in 1990s? Well, there's a bit chaos. The 90s, uh, well, let's start from the closest, from the history closest to us. So 1992, Milan is actually investigating, uh, is investigating a lot of politicians at the end of the First Republic. And from an international standpoint, we record the invasion of Kuwait, the war in Yugoslavia, 1990s, uh, plague of AIDS. Uh, and uh, we do also report a huge Russia economic crisis and uh, we are suffering with unemployment. So a number of uh, big issues, but actually Salone del Mobile goes on and on, uh, quite untouched, I should say. And this is also the image that we still refer back to the 90s. And uh, so it, we were still quite optimistic back in those years. And that is because uh, there were a lot of inventions, advances uh, taking place in technology and something else, which I have to say, and that is a advertisement, commercial. Commercials uh, start providing a way more comfortable and reassuring world with respect to the one that people were experiencing back then. 1990s, uh, from a, a mobile, from a furniture, from a Salone de Mobile standpoint, uh, 
well, we had to report the so-called the interna internationalization that we soon start calling globalization in design. And there's this interesting phenomenon according to which Italian companies, they start looking around beyond the Italian borders uh, to look for creative people, collaborators, uh, and the uh, popular international designers, uh, they start colonizing, uh, I have to say, Italy as well, and they start working in Italian companies. And such phenomenon, uh, actually, on the one side, uh, it is uh, weakening the shape of objects and projects and pieces of furniture, as there are uh, let's say uh, designers who are working for the same companies uh, so they come up with very similar projects uh, but how can companies uh, still have their own identity they preserve their identity whilst uh, showcasing their boots in exhibition in trade fairs and uh, what is ephemeral is 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 of course uh, more and more clear also in the salon and those are the years uh, where there's also something else being consolidated, the idea of a brand, brand of companies, of course, which are struggling to, let's say, to make sure that, uh, that uh, they're all preserving their own identity and showcasing their identity. We speak through Archistar now, those years we had the uh, design stars, design stark, to better say, so actually brand is not just the company's brand, but also the brand of design is as important. As Andrea Brand used to say, 90s are the years where the profession of designer becomes a mass uh, profession. Schools of design are being established, uh, even universities. Uh, and there's a, an, an incredible proliferation of schools uh, and people who are willing to become designers. Salon del Mobile, of course, uh, provides an offers uh, a good entrance uh, for this inter-exchange with younger generation to take place. We come to the year 2000 then. 2001, well we all know the way it opened, so through 9-11. And 9-11, the terrorist attack, of course, will trigger a number of economic crises and critical moments. Well, actually, some of these crises haven't been digested quite yet, even uh, uh, by, 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 by the world uh, of furniture, which is not as heavily impacted as other industries. And that is uh, thanks to design. So actually being able to work on quality, to pursue quality, the quality that we've been able to reach out to thanks to Made in Italy. Made in Italy is now a brand per se, but originally when, a, when Made in Italy was being conceived, it does not just refer to Brianza, but also to the eastern part of Italy as well as Marche, Pesaro area. And actually Made in Italy as very one of a kind feature that all other factories, economies and places are not able to relaunch. First of all, the small size. So we're not as heavily as impacted as other industries, as I said, and also Made in Italy is very flexible. So when Italy, let's say, it starts being in pain uh, when it comes to export with respect, with respect to other countries which are becoming more and more competitive uh, from an export standpoint. Uh, well, although Italy is not the one place where people want to be to manufacture uh, because it is no longer that competitive, it's still boosting the greatest quality ever. And this, again, is a very dynamic exchange that is taking place, and it is bilateral exchange. So the world of design, the world of architecture, the world of furniture, of course, has to do with artisans. With uh, we, we call them companies, but uh, actually it is all craftsmanship based. Uh, there's a know-how that is unparalleled anywhere else, literally. So there is this uh, beautiful exchange in terms, say, uh, of uh, benefiting from people working, designing, but also there's a culture and a mindset of project which has been inherited by people 
that is coming from the world of design that again is in parallel once again so and that was a 2001 more broadly speaking but 2001 if we uh, zoom in to Italy actually Italy is experiencing something quite dramatic and that is the G8 event uh, in uh, Genoa just bear with me for a second as I'm trying to have some water Genoa during the G8 event actually one of the manifesto one of the general thinking that uh, let's say protestant uh, they were really pursuing let's say as an ideology is the one that Naomi Klein is describing in the no logo book now irrespective of the political and social shifts from this activist actually the topic for no logo meant let's try to overcome what has happened in the 1990s design is a mass market products are all the same for all over the world and products and objects were often being uh, made produced manufactured uh, whilst uh, no paying attention at all to people working on it to the manufacturers themselves so there was this idea to very much reject the logo to boycott the mass production the mass manufacturing but actually no logo in design in those years it actually transforms itself into something else because no logo is also the meaning of the world of the word muji and i'm only mentioning a company that is not exhibiting here in salone so those are the years when from a style standpoint it is all about minimalism and uh, those of you who have a uh, who have attended those years or you must have seen in books it is all about white laminate uh, and uh, many many private homes uh, would not have uh, any experimentation whatsoever it is all about uh, something super essential style free years with no style this is is how the years 2000 are being defined with no styles whatsoever and uh, and actually that will turn into a neutral wall where designers or people themselves they will be able to step in through their own customization with their own choice there's like a kind of a white canvas the year the years 2000 from a salone del mobile standpoint uh, they're still very successful years uh, i have to say to the point that wallpaper is devoting a special number to the italian excellencies and what are the top three to wallpapers fellini director the leaning tower torre di pisa and salone del mobile in milan and in, in that very year actually the salone has been uh, recognized a uh, the award uh, um, the award of uh, ambrogino d'oro which means a lot for the city of milan it is one of the most prestigious recognition that we can get in the city those are the years uh, when from a language standpoint there are very few movements i have to say but there are as many when it comes to processes uh, in money in production and this is something that it, it is kind of a setting off in the year 2000 that, that we may still measure so i'm talking about objects that are no longer talking from a language standpoint perhaps and not so explicitly but they start actually casting a different light on the process that they're made of through which they're made of and from here of course uh, the whole of the new technology is being uh, uh, being told 2004 something else happens and that is again crucial for the history of salone and that is uh, studio cherry is inherited by massimo vignelli who wrote the bible of the image of, uh, of salone del mobile so 2004 uh, studio cherry is inheriting all this and they will design the new logo of the saloni you know that square that is a it's kind of 
Triste, uh, uh, bending down, where all the letters uh, of uh, Salone are. Well, actually, it took a while myself, although I'm a researcher on that, I, I took a while to understand what exactly this is. You see, each letter it is like positioned on a wall on each of every boot so it is like this kind of flying over and you see it from up above and um, and uh, and this is how the lettering can now be perceived Salone del Mobile during the year 2000 is experiencing huge success when it becomes international because there are more salones actually. One salone in Shanghai, one salone in New York and one salone in Moscow. So Salone del Mobile really becomes uh, the most important to celebrate design and Milan becomes a real capital city. 2010, as I'm approaching my conclusions, 2010 uh, were to be perhaps the easiest to tell about because uh, I think I've been through all of the different editions of the Salone, but I have to say they have been uh, the most difficult decade to, to tell through in this kind of mutual exchange that I'm, I'm trying to tell through so furniture and salone and the context you know and I think that largely depends uh, upon uh, an historical proximity that does not allow us uh, to have the right lens uh, through which you can read things more objectively but I think it does also depend upon a second thing whilst for a number of years and we've seen that I've tried to tell you about it so well production manufacturing in furniture is very much mirroring uh, what is a uh, let's say what is happening uh, from a social economic cultural standpoint well it is like all of a sudden, there's a complete disconnection between these two things. So, well, they are no longer talking to each other, context and uh, the way it mirrors uh, into the furniture manufacturing. On the one side, of course, uh, the private home, and I have been interviewed a lot and the people have always asked me what is the private home of the future, what is the trend for the private home of the future, you know, as we always have in mind that if we consider the the topic of a private home you may expect the shape of your house and also you may expect the shape of men and women in the future, well actually private home can be a, a very large environment uh, it can be a huge environment and it takes ages it takes centuries uh, to record uh, changes uh, and perhaps advances that might have taken place uh, in other in other environments and and the furniture does so as well so the well the furniture the furniture industry is not welcoming changes uh, as a uh, as fast and so such disconnection I've just described can be greatly appreciated as we go forward, as we go forward during 2010. Extraordinary years, 2019, which has been the latest edition before this one, because actually, let me just open a bracket here. 2020. It, it, it has been counted, uh, it has been numbered as an edition of Salone, although it did not take place. And I love to say, with respect to what I said earlier on, uh, the conversation with context, uh, well, 2020, there was no edition, uh, but that has been a very consistent choice because of what we were experiencing. Silence was having a great conversation with the pandemic, of course, uh, as we were all immersed uh, within that same scenario. 2019 had been a very successful year. This is becoming even more successful this year. So exhibitors uh, from 1800 are over 2000 this year. From uh, 380,000 visitors, uh, I think they are approaching 400 
thousand, perhaps were very close, including, uh, and I would have included my sister if, if, if only she had paid the ticket to come in. Uh, but back to 2017, to once again uh, emphasize uh, how Salone del Mobile has uh, greatly impacted the export as well as the overall thinking of design, Italian design in the world. So back in 2017, the Ministry of Economic Development as well as Cultural and uh, uh, Foreign Affairs, along with the Triennale Design Museum, they're inaugurating the Italian Design Day. And I think all over the world uh, nowadays in many different time zones, uh, I, I do believe there are people listening to me right now. So warm greetings to ambassadors uh, and uh, to consulate who are watching from all over the world, even if they're watching on a later stage. So this is a special day devoted to Italian uh, design. So curators, historical designers, uh, architects, uh, they have their own day, which is usually happening in March. On that very day, they do walk uh, to research centers, academia, and cultural institutions of the main cities uh, uh, all over the world. I think we're about 100, and they speak through Italian design. And in 2020, again, well, that edition was being organized, but it was all remotely organized. And it was a great opportunity, of course, uh, to, to aim for this beautiful network uh, that we all talk through. 2018 for Salone is the year of the manifesto. It is a manifesto with nine words, like the seven dwarf, I only know six. I try to tell those I remember, enterprise, culture, city, young, genius, and somebody else, somebody else, emotions, yes, beauty, yes, you see, you see what a team we are here. So those were the words uh, from the manifesto of the Salone uh, that were being going back in a, uh, uh, 2018 and then September last Super Salone was being organized that is not being considered as a full edition although I have to say it's been a great opportunity to uh, keep uh, the conversation alive a conversation between exhibitors the city between the city and the culture of design and I, I'd love to close with a final image. So in my role, and uh, perhaps many of you here are in a similar role as I am, or let, let's say that you work within the design industry, you know, what we have all heard, uh, what we've been told even by our inner voice, you know, in a very dramatic moment like the one that we're experiencing now, you know, we are the uh, notorious uh, violin players on the Titanic. You know, we are on a big ship, we are kind of uh, set in a drift, but we still keep uh, talking through beauty, project, research, numbers are great and but actually, even more precise than the image of Titanic is the following metaphor, which is the one that I love to leave you with, which is a metaphor that I'm actually inheriting from a master of all of us, Alessandro Mendini, who passed away in 2019. Okay, here I am with my new microphone. As uh, Mendini was uh, speaking through Domus, uh, the magazine of architecture and design, he has had it for, for many years. Uh, so he used to say the following, it is a transatlantic. And uh, in my view, this idea of a transatlantic 
to tell what Salon and Mobile is, I think there couldn't be any more relevant idea that this ocean liner, which is actually transporting goods and people from a site to next, and it goes on and it goes on endlessly, and nothing, nothing can stop it in its movement, which is very slow, but it is unstoppable. And as it happens in ocean liners, it is a kind of a, a, you know, a little bit above the sea level. So the one thing that I'd love to say, and no longer metaphor here, if the waters are not there anymore all of a sudden because we no longer have water on the planet, I would still imagine that the Salon del Mobile will still find a place to be run. We are landing on Mars and perhaps the edition of 2050 celebrating the 70 years of Salon del Mobile will be on a different planet. Thank you.